Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show, Episode 10. My name is Kenneth McCor. Thank you very much for joining in. Appreciate it a lot. Before I get into some of that, some of the top stories that I'm following for this uh, time period, I wanted to just start off with an overwhelming thank you for all the support that I got for my last show. I received um, hundreds of comments, really. It was just kind of a really humbling experience to read all the positive comments. I want to say thank you to everybody who submitted those and also for the initial support that I got through Patreon uh, uh, supporters. I put the call out last time and people responded and it's a very heartfelt and again, um, just you know, extremely uh, grateful for the support that I've received so far on Patreon. So I thank you very much for that. What I wanted to talk about, obviously what's, what's hitting the headlines over the last couple of days, um, being the time period I'm recording this show, is the Tesla quarterly reports and all the information about that. I'm not going to get into the summaries. There's lots of people covering that. There's, there's tons and tons of media coverage. In fact, I think there's too much media coverage, if you want to be honest. Um, I want to talk about, you know, the momentum and what, what we're seeing here from a Tesla and a Model 3 perspective. Um, you know, it's great to see the momentum that they're generating. And as I mentioned, there's, there's lots and lots of media coverage coming on the Model 3. You know, the latest July EV sales, um, you know, Tesla Model 3 by far has led the way. Um, the North American numbers, it certainly was a landslide um, with some of those in Canada as well. Those numbers equate to over 14,000 Model 3 deliveries for the month of July. That's outstanding. Uh, they've been really able to crank that up uh, in, in, in a relatively short period of time. I think that puts the year-to-date numbers somewhere in the 38, 39, 40,000, let's say 40,000 range if you include Canada into that mix, maybe slightly more for year-to-date deliveries for the Model 3 in North America. Of course, that's the only, these are the only countries that they're delivering right now. Uh, is in the United States and Canada. Now, Tesla has said in their last report, uh, the quarterly report from yesterday, that they are going to try to achieve 50 to 55,000 Model 3 deliveries for quarter three, or, or pr production, sorry, of Model 3s for the third quarter. That's their third fiscal quarter, which is a, a month off or so of calendar. And, you know, let's let's assume that they try to do the same for, for, the, for Q4. Um, I, that would put an estimate of a total year, uh, calendar year sales prediction for Model 3s at around 120 to 150,000 units. Um, Tesla is indicating, Elon indicated that he wants to ramp up the Model 3 production even further. He wants to get to 10,000 a week, but he said the reality of that happening is by closer to the end of the year. Um, so I'm not going to really go into analyze all the numbers. I think that, again, that that's outstanding, the job that Tesla is doing and being able to really get these Model 3s out. And, and, you know, I've been saying this for a long time, crank them out, got to get them out, got to get them out. I'm very, very excited for them. Everything's trending nicely for those, uh, for them. And for all those haters and shorters that are out there, uh, you guys can just take a hike. I mean, Tesla is not going anywhere. They're here to stay. So that's the reality. You better deal with it. Uh, if not, move along. Um, one thing, though, however, I've, I've observed is that, as I mentioned, every media outlet, I'm reading websites upon websites, and nine out of ten stories on, on the websites are Tesla-related, have Tesla, Tesla, Tesla. You know, and it's great that they get the coverage. Um, but I'm, I'm really kind of surprised at all this attention that Tesla is getting. And, and let me tell you why. So, you know, I've been following, and many of you know, I've been following Tesla since the reveal uh, for the Model 3 in March of 2016. So I'm no expert. I'm very excited about the electric vehicle marketplace and, what, and, you know, and I'm so excited to watch what's going on, hence the reason I'm doing these shows, um, from a global perspective, because it really is, there's the momentum not just here in North America, not just in California and Fremont, but really around the world. It's exciting to see. And, and you know, I, I challenge you to look beyond your regions and your countries for what's going on in this movement because it's outstanding, I'll, I'll tell you that. So, and it's not just coming from one car manufacturer. So what I'm trying to say here is that what we're seeing now for these July delivery numbers and what we've been seeing over the last few months and will continue to see from Tesla is just really the realization of Tesla doing what they said they would do some months or even years ago. When the Model 3 was revealed, it was a phenomenal event because after that re reveal, you know, a couple of months later, they had an outstanding number of reservations, which quantified to over about 400,000 in a short period of time. I call those reservations back orders, right? I want to order a product. It's not in stock, so it's in a back order until I get stock. It's a similar aspect from cars. 
So that feat alone was never seen on a scale that occurred. And we, you know, we've talked about that on other shows, uh, analysis to the Mustang from the 60s, unheard of, kind of like the iPhone moment in car, uh, you know, especially in car achievement, never mind electric vehicle achievements. So it was really a stellar event. And after some time, Tesla, you know, is now in full swing in manufacturing and they're pumping out the Model 3s by the thousands weekly, which, which we are hearing constantly. And again, as Elon promised that they would, plus or minus a little bit of time that he thought it would happen. Well, you know, in my opinion, he has to, and I've been saying this for a long time. He's really just trying to get inventory out there to fulfill the, the large hundreds of thousands of back orders that he has for the Model 3 coming from people around the world. It's no surprise. He's got 400,000 deliveries to do. So if we use those numbers and extrapolate out, and again, I'm no scientist, I'm no mathematical genius, I'm just doing a little bit of summary here to give you some, some, some framework to, to, to think about. In order for Elon to clear the back orders of existing reservations that he has for the Model 3, it takes about another year or so. And again, in that mix, he's got to throw in right-hand drive vehicles. So that's about a year or so just to achieve that. And then, of course, there's continuing to get to be new orders coming in. We don't know how many, but we know that people are now seeing the Model 3s on the streets. They're seeing them in showrooms, in stores. Uh, they're starting to be able to test drive them now. Uh, you, can, you can order test drives, for, from what I understand. So it's now hitting the mass public sphere, and people are able to touch, feel, see, and try these cars out, fall in love with them, and, and order them. So on top of the back orders that he has to fill, he's got new orders that are coming in. So the production numbers are going to be industry leading. There's no reason why they shouldn't be because they have to. They have to fulfill these orders, this huge pool of back orders they have, plus new orders that are coming in. So why am, this is not a surprise. This is what they've planned to do. This is what they said they're going to do. And they're executing on that plan. You know, the longer people sit and wait and have a reservation or are thinking about it and they can't deliver these vehicles, the longer or the greater chance it is for that person to either, for Tesla's sake, get another EV or look at maybe staying with a petrol car uh, and, and not getting into something with a plug. And, and to me, that's what this whole thing is about, is getting people into a vehicle that has a plug. Whether it be a plug-in hybrid or a full battery electric vehicle, we can argue the pros and cons of that. But a plug, a plug is a plug and any plug is a step in the right direction. If it's zero emission, all electric, that's the best that's the best way you know we'd like you to go I'd like you to go but even if you don't at least it's a step in the right direction for those reasons so I congratulate Tesla and I'm glad of the performance that they said they're going to do that they're now achieving those results and continuing to grow on that but I just wanted to put some perspective there's no reason you know to go crazy over this because this is what they've planned so there's really no surprise so I hope that puts a little perspective on the Tesla um, you know, I love Tesla. Don't get me wrong. I don't bash Tesla. Some people accuse me of bashing Tesla and not lo liking Tesla. I love them. They're a catalyst for this environment. You know, they really awakened a sleeping giant from the EV marketplace, as we're seeing now with, with dozens of manufacturers devoting entire lines and, and spending billions in efforts for electrification strategies. They've awoken this. They've achieved that. They will continue to lead, but they're not going to be the leader forever. Other people are going to pick up. And even if, they're, even if they are or they aren't, it doesn't matter. Anybody that gets into something with a plug, in my mind, that's a good decision. Doesn't have to be a Tesla. Doesn't have to be a Nissan Leaf. Doesn't have to be a Bolt or a Volt or an Ionic or anything else. As long as it's got something with a plug, and if it's you know if for their needs, it's a step in the right direction for and for the ultimate goal of, of impacting our environment positively. So I just want to get that out there for everybody, and I hope you can see a little bit different perspective on what's going on uh, the with the current news. So there's a company called Energy Absolute, uh, and they're based in Thailand, and they've just announced that they're going to spend $3 billion. They plan to build a new battery manufacturing plant in Thailand to open around the end of 2019. And they're going to start off with producing about one gigawatt hour, if I have that right, of batteries for electric vehicles and grid storage scenarios and solutions. Now, they also over time plan to expand that to 50 gigawatt hours per year, 
production levels. Uh, and just to put that in, in relative terms that you may be familiar with, that's about 50% more than what the what Tesla's completed Gigafactory will produce once it's finished uh, and up and fully operational in Reno. Uh, that's uh, This plant will be 50% more output, so that's quite an achievement. And which is good because Elon kept saying we need more people to, to you know build batteries, we need more of that kind of stuff. So uh, all that stuff is good and, and we need more of that. Now Absolute Energy is also planning to install up to a thousand stations, charging stations in Bangkok and other areas in Thailand. All right, so let's get on to some auto news. Um, there was a great article that came out from an achievement by Nissan that they were able to climb the and conquer what's called the Three Peaks Challenge. And I've been following this story because uh, one of the guys in that, Chris, uh, from uh, EV Adventures, uh, I believe it's EV Adventures or Plug-in Adventures. Uh, I'll, I'll put the link, uh, the right thing uh, on the show. Um, he's involved in this project and what it was is uh, they've, they've taken a Nissan Leaf, a 2018 Nissan Leaf, and uh, it's actually, by the way, the only battery electric car other than the Tesla Model S to complete this challenge. So it's quite the feat. Um, what it involves is driving about 462 miles or 744 kilometers. Um, in a 24 hour period, and this is uh, with limited fast charging availability. Uh, it includes ascending and descending three of the highest peaks uh, in the UK, uh, Scotland uh, Ben Nevis Peak at 1345 meters, in England the Scafell Pike Peak or Mountain at 978 meters, and in Wales Snowdon Mountain at 1085 meters. Now a portion of that included walking, so it's a two-man team scenario, and the walking uh, added up to about 23 miles or 37 kilometers up and down, uh, you know, climbing, hiking up and hiking down these mountains. And again, all this, the driving and the walking and the combination of the effort had to be done within 24 hours to complete this challenge. Well, the LEAF team, as I mentioned, successfully completed it in 23 hours and 40 minutes. Um, and again, it's the only, the second electric vehicle, all electric vehicle to do this challenge successfully in 24 hours or less. The, to, the, the Tesla Model S did it earlier. I don't have the time for the Model S. I'm sure it was, it was faster. There's no doubt in my mind there. Um, and you know, the, the, uh, the achievement really for the Nissan Leaf excuse me, and the crew was accredited to the extra range uh, that the uh, larger battery gives on the 2018 LEAF. Um, uh, Chris had mentioned that ProPilot uh, helped a lot to relieve some of the motorway fatigue because it's something you have to kind of go, go, go over 24 hours. They don't sleep, they just go, go, go. Um, and e-pedal, he said, was great at encouraging efficient driving. So recuperating energy, and he uses some his own techniques as well for energy recuperation to try to make it last. Again, the objective is to get from A to B in the fastest time possible. So congratulations to Nissan on the team. Quick update on the Audi e-tron. I talked about it on the last show. Some more information came out after I aired that. Um, they're actually starting to take reservations for the e-tron uh, on September 17th in the United States. There'll be a $1,000 USD refundable reservation fee that you could apply to put money down on that reservation. Um, now again, it's an important vehicle for Audi. It's their first all-electric vehicle. Uh, it's an SUV aimed at the premium market, of course. That's what Audi plays in. I don't have any other specs. I believe I said some specs on the last show, but you can certainly look it up. And if you want to register or learn, learn more about the vehicle, go to www.audiusa.com. Staying in luxury cars, Mercedes has announced production versions of the all-new EQC. Uh, electric vehicle will be unveiled on September 4th, uh, I believe in Europe at one of the shows. And then that those production uh, versions are going to make their rounds at various uh, international auto shows, including LA and Detroit. Now I don't have any official specs that I could find yet on the EQC, um, but dual motor uh, estimated to be about 300 kilowatts each. Uh, All-wheel drive, of course, uh, 0 to 62 or 0 to 100 km per hour speed uh, estimates in the less than or very much less than 5 seconds is what they say, I believe. Uh, the concept has a 70 kilowatt hour battery pack and the official market launch for the EQC vehicles will be uh, next year, probably I'm guessing mid, uh, mid to later next year. And since we're you know, in the high-end market spending lots of money here that we don't have, fictitious money, let's talk about, talk about the Porsche. Porsche Taycan, excuse me. Um, it's 
uh, the previous name for this is the Mission E, and, and I've talked about the Mission E in the past, so they're now changing the name to the Taycan. Production is due in 2019 for this vehicle, and it's going to be Porsche's first all-electric vehicle in the company's history. It's going to have two motors with a combined output of 600 horsepower plus 440 kilowatts. Uh, Lithium-ion battery packs, of course, with a range estimated at about 500 kilometers or 310 miles. Uh, it'll have um, DC fast charging capability, and Porsche is claiming that you'll only need 15-minute charge to get about 400 kilometers or 248 miles of range, and that's using 800 volt CCS combo chargers. And of course, Porsche is no, um, you know, no, they're not shy for speed and a performance, and they're estimating that this uh, electric vehicle will go zero to 62 in under three and a half seconds, uh, probably closer to three seconds from some of the stuff that I've read. So uh, very fast, zero to 100 kilometer an hour times. And uh, Porsche plans a limited production of these of about 20,000 units a year, at least to start. And my friends in Australia, I uh, get lots of comments and emails uh, and uh, messages from folks in Australia, love the country, been there many times. Well, some good news, you're finally getting the ability to buy the Renault Zoe. It's, it was only available for fleets initially in the commercial side, and now it's been made open to the public. And public sales have started for basically Australia's most affordable all-electric battery electric vehicle. Prices will start at 47,490 Australian dollars. That equates to just over $35,000 US using today's FX. Um, these, uh, the dealers will be located in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. And uh, again, with the uh, 40 kilowatt hour battery, active cooling, a small nimble car, can hold five people in a pinch, four comfortably, has a bit of cargo room, really easy to drive. I think this car is going to do very well because it's uh, next to the Leaf overtaking the Zoe uh, in Europe. It's really been Europe's best-selling EV uh, battery electric vehicle for quite some time. So uh, good luck and congratulations on that. And uh, I'd love to hear from some Australian new EV drivers when they get their Zoe. If they get one, send me an email and let me know how it goes. I mentioned earlier about the Model 3 production and uh, how busy Tesla is and that they're really doing quite well in ramping up to crank out cars. There's been some stories and some chatter about Tesla service uh, having to deal with all these cars that are, going to be, that are now flooding the market, for lack of better words, and will continue to grow that market space. Now, Tesla has been working diligently to improving their service. I mean, they do have award-winning customer service, no doubt about that. Um, it, it's a good problem to have, right? And they are, tr because they are transitioning very quickly, really from a small niche automaker, now to a major, major presence. I talked in the last show about how their numbers line up from production values to Ford and Toyota. I mean, you know, they're playing in the big kids game now. They're up there. And because of that growth, they need to be able to back it with the back end service for their, for their vehicles. So the impacts can be of this growth can be widespread and they've got to really make sure that components like infrastructure and service are ramped up accordingly since the production is. So for servicing needs, we know that Tesla um, is increasing staff in many of the centers and trying to potentially open up more service centers as well. And they're also piloting a small network of their own body shops. Previously, most of the or all of the body work has been outsourced to um, partnered body shops that are that are officially qualified by Tesla to be able to perform that service. Well, now instead of using that third party, they're going to do their own, and they're piloting that. I, I don't have information on where. I'm assuming it's California and some of the local areas, but it could be in other states and other uh, areas as well. And they're also opening more parts distribution centers, including overseas in Europe, and that's going to be great to be able to facilitate the growth that the Model 3 will certainly have in the European landscape. So, and they're also planning, and they've uh, talked about this before, that they're going to just an ongoing continuation of expanding the mobile service program, the Rangers, I believe, so that they can continue to take service out to the field as opposed to having owners come into shops for minor things and things that they can fix out in the field. So congratulations, Tesla, on continuing on recognizing that need and continuing to move forward to improve your service as you grow as a car company. 
Now, in other news, I talked about mass transit EV adoption on the last show. And as soon as, you know, doesn't it always, always happen. As soon as I just put something out there to air, I get another story that fit right into that episode. So I wanted to just quickly talk about um, some uh, another mass transit EV adoption uh, purchaser. Uh, of course, I reported last time about London and Oslo that they uh, put some bulk orders in for new EV buses from BYD. Well, BYD in China has also received an order for 10 of their 40-foot transit buses from here locally, the Toronto Transit Commission, or the TTC as we like to call them. Uh, by the way, they're Canada's largest transit operator, and they're also the third largest transit operator in North America. That's quite an achievement. We do have a very good transit system here in Toronto. Uh, TTC has the option to report to, sorry, to purchase 30 uh, or more buses later on, but they're going to get 10 to start, and they expect the rollout of these sometime next year. I know that there are other municipalities, uh, Brampton and some others, that are piloting electric buses as well, so I think we'll start to see a bit of a domino effect as far as um, purchasing and, and, and transit fleets getting into the full electric bus game. And a quick update to a previous story. On my last show, I spoke as well about the challenges of, of EV buyers are having today. Now that we've convinced people to buy an EV, they're going out to try to find to get one, but they can't find one. Uh, deliveries are in short demand in a lot of a lot of places, and I talked about that. Um, on, and the report that I sourced for that story didn't mention the BMW i3. So I've looked into this, and from what I can understand, I've made some calls and some inquiries. And here in Canada, the 2018 models of the i3 are sold out. So BMW Canada is now taking orders, and dealers are taking orders for model year 2019 i3 versions. Um, that's, again, both battery only and Rex versions. Uh, the earliest deliveries, from what they're telling me, are going to start happening for those 2019s in the November-December time frame of this year. In the USA, I'm hearing it's a similar situation, um, but they tend to get more allocations of inventory because these vehicles are built overseas. So therefore, the wait times might be a little bit quicker for new orders. It could be somewhere in the area of two to three months. I'm not sure. If anybody has an i3 that they've ordered in the US, um, that they live in the US, and they've been given some delivery dates or some time frames, please send me an email. I'd love to hear about you so I can update my stats on that. And my understanding from Europe is that it's a factory build situation, which is about a, a three three month lead time. So it's not really a lot of inventory of i3s in Europe. It's basically build to spec. Once you put an order in, it's taking about three months to build. Uh, so again, if you're in the market for a battery electric vehicle and looking at an i3, um, they're going to take a, a few months to get. Uh, and my thanks to uh, one of my viewers, uh, his, his name is David McDonald. He asked me about this in the last uh, YouTube comments. So I looked into it and I hope that uh, that's satisfied your curiosity, David. And uh, thank you for asking the question. All right, so it's mailbag time. Always love mailbag. I got one email after the last show that I want to get into. Um, and this is from uh, uh, TJ Dessel, if I'm getting that right, because it's, it's, it's an acronym name. Um, TJ, uh, I'll, I'll use that part, uh, does not say where he or she is from. Um, but the, the basis of the question was regarding plug-in electric hybrids versus full battery electric hybrids. Uh, but the question is about that uh, TJ is starting to see more and more plug-in electric hybrids occupy charging spots. Um, so he's asking me the question of uh, how do I see the overall best scenario for EVs and their infrastructure maybe five years out, 10 years out, or 20 years out, especially when fossil fuels are hopefully a relic of the past. So thank you for the question, TJ. I don't think fossil fuels in 20 years will be a relic of the past. Fossil fuels are going to be here for quite some time. Uh, I think from a consumer perspective, we can definitely see the majority of transportation being electrified and potentially full electric um, within 50 years, maybe 20, maybe 30 years. It's, it's a tough judge at this point because infrastructure is going to be key for that growth, not necessarily the technology, but all the supporting ecosystems are going to be key there in sustaining and, and managing that growth. Um, but how do I see EV infrastructure? Well, you know, I've talked about this quite a lot. EV infrastructure is growing. Um, there's announcements all the time of new chargers being built and so forth, and partnerships, and even the big oil gas companies are getting into the game. We talked about BP and Shell before, um, that they are, you know, they're either acquiring EV charger companies or they're going to build their own to augment their gas stations, and that's what we're seeing happening. So the, the expansion of EV charging infrastructure is continuing to grow, and it will continue to grow more at an accelerated pace as charger technology gets cheaper, 
even on the fast, the public fast charging side and more carriers or the, the, the big carriers that are providing those services today, other producers expand even more because now they're starting to make a profit in, in all that uh, capital they've outlaid already as people start to use their charging outlets. So I do see a very quick ramp up of electric charging infrastructure, uh, especially within the time periods that, that you've mentioned as more battery electric and, and hybrid electric vehicles come on the line. So obviously the question of, can I get to a stall and find it empty? So when I need it, that could be a problem uh, regardless of it's a plug-in hybrid or a battery electric vehicle because we know the Model 3 is flooding the market and more and more models are coming out uh, year after year. So I thank you for your question. Don't really have a, a, you know, a hard crystal ball to look into to give you a d definitive answer on that. Um, but I do see that infrastructure will continue to grow to handle the use. And as I mentioned on a previous show a few episodes back, 90% of charging will be done at home in, in a lot of cases. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be that bad of a problem. Uh, it may be for the short time as, you know, as I, we talked about, or as I talked about that EV sales are through the roof and that they're continuing to climb and as infrastructure catches up, but that gap shouldn't be too long. And um, it, it will, the infrastructure should be there to be able to satisfy the needs of most EVs relatively soon. So thank you, TJ, for the question. I appreciate it. All right, so like I said, Fast and Furious at the top of the show. Um, we're done. That's it for this episode of the EV Revolution Show, episode 10. I love to hear from everybody, and, and as I mentioned off the top, thanks for all the comments on YouTube. Uh, please send me an email if you've got a questions. You can also voice your question in the form of a video, which I'll air in the show, or if you want to do an audio, and I'll put that online, I'll put that on air. And if you've got a question that you want to ask, or just write it down and send me an email to evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter and respond that way at evrevshow is the Twitter handle. Um, as always, if you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel, I would ask you to please do that. Click that little bell as well so you'll get notified when new episodes appear automatically. Don't have to go check and scroll. Every subscriber means a lot. As I mentioned, I did put together and have started a new audio podcast series. So you can search iTunes for that. Look for EV Revolution Audio Podcast. Oh, by the way, this week it went live on Google Play. And I thank one of our viewers for the suggestion there of putting it on Google Play. Uh, it was actually a pretty easy process. took only a few days for it to get approved, and it's now available and searchable on the Google Play Store. So uh, have a listen. I'll be uh, doing my next audio podcast in about a week's time with a very special guest, so stay tuned. That's going to be a really interesting one. And, of course, um, I started off the top of the show with a big heartfelt thanks for Patreon supporters, and I do encourage, if you feel up to it, you want to continue to support me and, and support the growth of the show by doing a pledge through Patreon. So I appreciate it a lot. You can go to patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show, and you can pledge there through Patreon. And, again, for everybody that has pledged or is considering it, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. And that takes me to the end of this episode. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and wish everybody the best. And until next time, take care and we'll see you later.